good morning everyone uh, a warm welcome to the first young physicians forum for the year 2024 i am dr dumindra munidas immediate past president representing dr bulisana like president for 2024 uh, so today the young physicians forum will be uh, presented by two uh, senior registrars and please remember that this is a contest where we award the EMBJ Rama award for the best presentation and then the SIPLA uh, award for the uh, merit award for three people. Hence, uh, presenters, please note it's you are given only 25 minutes to present and there will be five minutes per question. So it's very important to stick to time. Otherwise, we, we, we are going over time, we'll be notifying and stopping you at the time. Uh, so, to start up today's presentations, I would like to invite Dr. Manisha Pumini Jayasiri, Senior Registrar in Respiratory Medicine, National Hospital for Respiratory Diseases. She will be talking to us on breathless battle, uh, tackling acute presentations of ILD. Over to you, Manisha. So, um... Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, thank you, sir, for that uh, warm introduction. So, and I'm truly grateful for to the CCP for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk on this valuable uh, topic. And uh, I really uh, feel uh, privileged to be in front of this esteemed audience. And uh, so, without further ado, uh, let me dive into the topic of today's topic. Uh, uh, how to handle acute PhD presentations in patients with ILD. So for the next 25 to 30 minutes or so, I'll be covering the following in following outline in my tour. So I, I appreciate that uh, your, your, your patience and I hope that you'll stay with me until the very end. So let's set to set the stage, let's dive into the classifications of ILD. So with over 200 uh, conditions falling under this umbrella term, ILD can be broadly divided into two categories, those with the known cause and idiopathic ILDs. So the commonest ILDs that we encounter is IP, it's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, and it is known to have the highest number of exacerbations among the chronic ILDs as well. So I'll be addressing the rest of the ILDs as non-IPF ILDs hereafter. And among the non-IPF ILDs, uh, the connective tissue disorder associated ILDs, the hypersensitive pneumonitis, and the drug induced uh, ILDs are the ones that commonly come, come with uh, acute presentations. So, uh, when a patient presents to us with a worsening hypoxia, in the context of ILD, we have to, there are two likely clinical scenarios. So, one is uh, when a known ILD patient coming with acute respiratory failure, and the second one is a de novo presentation in a patient who has never been diagnosed with an ILD, so which is a more challenging case. So to add some interest, I will share a recent case that we have managed. So this is a case of de novo presentation of connective tissue ILD as a rapidly progressive respiratory failure. So this patient is a 42-year-old previously healthy male, came in with rapidly worsening shortness of breath and having type 1 respiratory failure on admission with 90% saturation on room air. So interestingly, in his history, he also had constitutional symptoms suggesting connective tissue disorder in the background, including small joint arthralgia, painful oral ulcers, digital ulcers, and ulcers over the external auricles, as shown in these images. And there were no uh, significant exposures were reported. There were no features suggestive of fluid overload. And his oxygen uh, requirement rapidly worsened, necessitating high flow uh, nasal oxygen and eventual required intubation. So you can see in his chest x-rays, there's a rapid worsening over a few a couple of days. And in the chest HR CT, you can see widespread bilateral ground glass opacities as well. So what, what do you think is a diagnosis? A de novo presentation of possible anti-MDA5 antibody-mediated dermatitis was made following an urgent multidisciplinary meeting and treatment commenced with immunosuppression and a broad spectrum antibiotic cover. So patient has to, uh, we have given IV methylprednisolone pulses. On top of that, we have pulsed him with IVIG and one uh, cyclophosphamide pulse and oral capacity pulse also started. But however, despite all these measures, patient ultimately ended up dying. 
So this uh, case emphasizes the importance of recognizing the types of ILD that can present de novo, where the management will be different from the beginning, where we need to start with more immunosuppressions most of the times. And I have lessons to watch out for. So those are the, uh, in the uh, under, under the connective tissue disorder ILDs, dermatomyositis, anti-MDF5, dermatomyositis associated ILDs, anti-synthetic syndrome, systemic sclerosis, SLE with uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhages, and mixed connective tissue disorders are the uh, common, uh, common ones. Whereas the drug induced ILD also, we have come across several patients coming with acute worsening uh, in the background, sometimes in the background of connective tissue disorder ILD, such as metotrexate, and also the, uh, sometimes the patients who are being treated for lung cancer, lung, uh, malignancies, and background malignancies, who has been given chemotherapies and immune checkpoint, uh, checkpoint uh, uh, agents and coming with uh, acute pneumonitis. Apart from that, several acute presentations has been uh, we have encountered are the hypersensitive pneumonitis, acute eosinophilic pneumonias, and the anti-associated vasculitis, and the acute interstitial pneumonias. So when suspecting a de novo ILD with having a very acute presentation with rapidly progressive respiratory failure, it's very crucial that we go into uh, the uh, very thorough history, which including the which includes uh, rheumatological symptoms as well as uh, to ask for a features of vasculitis. And also, it's very important to go for a better occupational uh, history uh, in regards to several exposures as well as uh, environmental exposures as well. Drug history is also very important. So uh, we think at the outset, it's better to obtain it's very, uh, good practice to obtain the autoimmune panel if you are really suspecting underlying connective tissue disorder in these patients, in, which includes uh, the ANA rheumatoid factors and the ENA panel, if possible, uh, to, because we need to take uh, important uh, management decisions at the beginning. And sometimes when patients come in with these acute conditions, sometimes to exclude acute eosinophilic pneumonias and diffuse alveolar hemorrhages and the infections, bronchoscopy and BAL will also help us. So uh, when patients with an IED come in with an acute dyspneic presentation, it's usually they present with type 1 respiratory failure, but sometimes they do present with type 2 respiratory failures. When they, then in the, those instances, we have to think of coexisting airway disorders and then obesity with the OHS, or there it may be the more advanced presentation of the, the primary underlying exacerbation in their ILDs coming with more advanced presentation with muscle fatigue and respiratory exhaustion. So what is the cause for acute respiratory failure in most of these patients whom we are suspecting underlying ILD? Is it an exacerbation always? No, there are a lot of other causes that we have to look into, non-ILD causes. So if we can exclude non-respiratory causes like anemia, there are, again, more than eight respiratory-related diagnoses that can cause respiratory decompensation in a patient having uh, coming with respiratory decompensation in a patient with ILD. So obtaining a good clinical history and a thorough physical, physical examination will definitely guide us towards uh, identifying the most likely scenario and thus the tailored care. So it gets more trickier because most of these conditions, as you can see, will can coexist in the same patient, making our lives more difficult. So uh, I'll take you through each of these cases individually in one by one. So infections and opportunistic infections has to be able excluded and because they are in high risk of having usual infections as well as the opportunistic infections. Most of the patients with connective tissue disorders with their immunosuppressants in the background, they are high risk of having opportunistic infections. And most of the time, they are on inappropriately over-the-counter prescriptions of uh, uh, inhaled corticosteroids and oral steroids. With, and they inherently have their uh, poor lung mechanics and the frequent hospital admissions, where they are more prone to get infections, including the opportunistic ones. The main ones that we have to consider are the PCP, CMV, fungal, and the tuberculous infections. So the fever, neutropenia, leukocytosis, lymphopenias, and high CRP levels, and, and the neutropenias will all you know, will indicate that underlying uh, suggestive of an infection, but always we have to take in, in, in our mind that it might also indicate that just the underlying inflammatory condition itself. So sometimes the, the more uh, better clues would be the HRCT features and procalcitonin. So it's very important that we take all the necessary action to exclude uh, infections in patients who are admitting with acute worsening in the background of ILD. So uh, because one thing, they are very at high risk, uh, in the beginning to save it and also at the end we might need to pulse them with steroids so it's very important that we exclude all the infection if possible so for the as for the investigations including the blood investigations basics 
the CRP is the Procalcitonin's annual sputum studies, which include which has to include the usual path bacterial pathogens, but also not to uh, forget the fungal infections, atypical infections, including PJP, CFV, and other uh, common viruses, because they can be the triggering factor. So, what is the use of uh, bron uh, utilization of bronchi bronchoscopies in ruling out infections? Well, yes, it is helpful in ruling out infections and alveolar hemorrhages in these acute presentation. In mainly in the patients who we cannot obtain a proper sputum sample. It's still a bit tricky, you know, we, so, uh, to undergo bronchoscopies uh, in, in, in unsafe patients who are already hypoxemic. So we have to be very careful identifying the patients who truly need these procedures and after evaluating the risk and the benefit. Definitely the biopsy has a very limited utility, so it's strongly discouraged. So despite all these investigations, we might not be able to pick up infections almost most of the time. So it's empirical antibiotics are very important, which will cover the, uh, sorry, which covers the uh, um, uh, positives, negatives, as well as sometimes empirically, we might need to start them on empirical antivirals sometimes too. And also, since the, the definitive diagnosis will take time, sometimes the patient is deteriorating, we, there's a place for treating them empirically with uh, Hotrim for the covering PJB and sometimes even the CAB. The second line immunosuppression drugs can be stopped usually, but the steroids, there is a tricky situation again, where if the patient has been on uh, long-term steroids for a very long duration, high doses, there is a possibility of uh, uh, provoking an adrenal crisis. So we have to take into that into our consideration as well. Then the next one is the heart failure, uh, where you can have uh, with acute coronary syndrome, since they are inherently have a very high cardiovascular risk, the patients with ILD. So this, and the diagnosis will be definitely challenging because we don't, with the X-rays will be suboptimal and on top of that, they will have their ILD changes on the chest X-ray, so making our uh, diagnosis difficult. And ECGs also, they can have abnormality secondary to hypoxia. So, but still, if we can, as for the practical tips, we have to under, uh, go through their past reports, previous echoes, and we can do the proper bedside clinical assessment, including ultrasound chest, to, and we can compare their past chest X-rays and the ECG serial top top buys and the BNPs and the two the echoes will help. And if still uncertain, we can try a small dose of IV pusamide and uh, provide that, that the blood pressure and all that are okay and ultimate uh, and assess thereafter. The pulmonary hypertension is another contender. So they are usually, it's a well-known complication of ILD. So if the patient will present with worsening in dyspnea, we have to always exclude pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure. So what are the tips? So the patient will be coming with worsening in dyspnea without worsening radiographic opacities and they will have disproportionately low DLCO. And the BNP, 2D echo, and the ECG again will help. So we have to identify these patients because they need more tailored management. The pulmonary embolism is another contender. So they definitely have high risk of uh, thrombosis because of the mobility, immobility, and the IPF is still, it's, it's known, as, known for itself as a prokaryotic condition. So d dimer levels will help in the beginning, but if it is negative, we can like, like strongly, like confidently exclude it. But if it is positive, we don't know. It could be due to the sepsis that is settling in, or it could be due to the multi-organ failure that the patient is settling in these acute conditions. So it's a clinical decision that we have to take. Even doing the uh, the most important investigation, CTPA is sometimes difficult in these uh, clinical scenarios. So pneumothorax is another cause that can be easily missed in supine X-rays. And the lung cancer, again, a cause for worsening shortness of breath. We have to always look into that in the imaging. And the drugs, sometimes the patients with connective tissue disorder ILDs who has been given methotrexate and leflunomide recently and it has a temporal association with the uh, uh, symptoms of short-term breath, we have to always think of uh, drug-induced hypersensitivity hepatitis. And also the chemotherapy agents, we have come across several patients coming up with uh, acute respiratory uh, deterioration who has been given these chemotherapies and immune checkpoint inhibitors and ultimately to be uh, diagnosed with ILDs. So if we can exclude all these things, yes, then we can diagnose ILD exacerbation. So acute exacerbation of ILD. What is acute exacerbation of ILD? So it's a, it's it's basically the this uh, definition is uh, for the IPF ILDs, which has more of the evidence and the studies has been done in the world, right? But however, when uh, sort of acute for a, to say that it's acute exacerbation, there should be a clinical worsening, which should be within thirty days. And it should be characterized by new bilateral ground glass opacities and the consolidation. And we have to exclude almost like the alternative etiologies. The same thing has been exploited for the connective tissue disorder ILD exacerbations as well. So why the 30-day demarcation? That is because 
uh, is to distinguish it from the acute, acute exacerbation from the natural progression of the chronic underlying ILD. So if we talk about the epidemiology of acute exacerbations of ILDs, you can see they have very high mortality. In, uh, in non-IPF ILD patients, compared to the IPF ones, have a better uh, mortality risk. But however, you can see the one-year mortality after acute exacerbation in IPF is around 90%. And in acute and non-IPF ILDs, including connective tissue disorder ILDs, it's nearing around 40%. So what are the risk factors for ILD exacerbation? So in, uh, there are several studies has been done and they have found out that more advanced the your ILD in the background, more, uh, you are more prone to get ILD exacerbations. So if you have low FEC, low DLCO, uh, if you have extensive fibrosis in your HRCTs and then you have uh, you are in LTOT at home and if the patient is having pulmonary hypertension, you are, you are, having, you are in high risk. And if the patient is on, on top of that, on the non ipf fibrotic ILDs, the UIP pattern in the background are rheumatoid arthritis ILDs, systemic sclerosis ILDs, and the polymyositis and the dermatomyositis are the ones, are the ones that get to uh, get more exacerbations. So are there any biomarkers to predict the acute exacerbations of ILD? Well, having biomarkers is important in these kind of conditions where we have a lot of differential diagnosis to you know, handle with and patient will be more symptomatic, ill. So we need to start treatment early and diagnose them early. So there are a lot of, the, currently there has been no established biomarkers uh, in the literature, but however, in the literature, there are two uh, biomarkers that has been identified mainly in the IL, IPF, the KLCs and the lung microbiome. And uh, uh, they have been identified and they, they are on the, on their move. So it's important to understand the pathophysiology behind the acute exacerbations. Most of these studies, again, has been done in IPF patients. So the histological, uh, uh, histological background uh, diagnosis is a diffuse alveolar damage. So, uh, but it actually had a spectrum in one, one, one uh, end, there is a, a, a organized pneumonia, and the other end, you have this intractable diffuse alveolar damage. So that's how you uh, decide that some, some of the patients will improve with steroids which more have this inflammatory part, whereas a patient who's having more diffuse alveolar damage will not improve with the steroids, that, which is the usual treatment in uh, still in the acute exacerbation of ILDs. So in, like in HRCTs, you will have this symmetrical diffuse ground glass opacities. Again, there are several EDs who are, which are, again, the most important contenders like pulmonary edemas, various atypical infections, and alveolar hemorrhages. So despite having existed this for a very long time in the literature, as well as having very high mortality, still we lack large clinical trials on the treatment of uh, acute ILD uh, exacerbations. So, and the, again, the, treat, uh, the evidence is mostly for the IPF exacerbations, not for the other, uh, other ILD exacerbation. So uh, taking the, in this into the mind, then we'll move on to the management. So we have the pharmacological treatment. So we'll be discussing about the steroids and the immunosuppressive use, antifibrotic use, and the other upcoming drugs. First, we will go, uh, go through the management of uh, exacerbations in IPF, and then we'll explore how it, is, it, it differs from the non-IPF ILDs. So in the acute exacerbation of IPF, usually in 2011, guidelines are listed to use steroids. Again, it's a very weak recommendation, and they have not recommended about the dose, route, and the duration. However, because of this low level of evidence and uh, having the serious prognostic implications with the acute exacerbation, most of the most of clinicians, including us, has this pragmatic approach of treating them with high dose steroids with a broad spectrum antibiotic cover. But there are some mounting evidence, uh, upcoming evidence to push clinicians away from using this aggressive immunosuppressive approach in the acute exacerbation of IPF. So this is one a study in 2012 in the NGM they have published, the Panther study, which shows that long-term use of dual immunosuppression in stable ILDs, which cause more harm than pain. So they will lead to more exacerbations as well. In 2021, Lancet, they have published this study where adding uh, cyclophosphamide on top of the IV methylprednisolone pulse has caused, definitely has increased three-month mortality risk. So at the moment, we don't... Uh, 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 we don't, uh, uh, we, we, we advise against use of intravenous cyclophosphamide in these patients. So despite with, the, with these like lack of evidence and all that, we still treat the patient with uh, steroid pulse. Doses ranges from 500 to 1000 milligrams per day for three consecutive days and is followed by one milligram per day. So slow tapering. Still, the survival is very, very low. So can we use low-dose steroids in these IPF uh, exacerbations? 
why can't we use why, what is the what is the disadvantage of using hydrostatic? Well, it will increase the risk of infections A and the B that it can cause fluid retention and contribute to worsening uh, for existing heart failure. So, is there a place for low uh, dose of uh, steroids in these patients? Yes, in recently they have published this retrospective study where they have identified that there is a place of low dose IP, uh, steroids in managing patients with IPF uh, A. What are the, the anything in the pipeline for uh, uh, acute reservation in IPF? Well, there are several, but at the moment we can't draw any definitive conclusion about their efficacy. So, how we differ from the management of acute exacerbation of non IPF ILD, that means the connective tissue disorder associated ILD. They have more inflammatory background, they have more organized, organized pneumonia in their background in pathology. So, it's better that it, so this in, in this in this uh, type we have to use aggressive immunosuppression from the outset for the management. That is how it differs from the IPF management. We are we now going outwards towards from the steroid immunosuppression. So in managing connective tissue disorder ILDs coming with acute exacerbation is a place that we really need a value multidisciplinary input in the diagnosis as well as in the management because we have to start them on aggressive immunosuppression from the outset if we need to have a better outcome. So do we need to stop? What about what is what is our uh, stand on antifibrotics during exacerbation? Well, they don't need to be stopped because they will not uh, immunosuppress us, as we all know. But they won't be. They has to be stopped if there is a, a derangement in the liver functions, if there is a derangement in the renal functions, or if the patient is having nausea, vomiting, and they can't take the uh, drug by mouth because we don't have any IV preparation at the moment. And forcing them will not rebound. Will of course lead into the rebounding of the disease itself. And there is there are some reports uh, studies suggesting that even if it's a mild or a moderate one without all these uh, uh, factors to stop, we can continue it during the exacerbation and it will might approve, uh, prevent the next exacerbation as well. So what is the management of the other important aspect in managing the acute exacerbation will be the supportive care. So for the, we have to give the proper oxygen, we have to use the NIV properly, and then we have to go for a mechanical ventilation in some patients, the symptomatic management and the palliative and the end of life care. So it's very crucial that we optimize the oxygen in these patients early because uh, we have to target the saturation of 94 to 98 patients and preferably close to 98%. And they will have this high peak inspiratory close because of the VQ mismatch and all that. So the usual, the usual, the word uh, NRBM that, that is a, uh, 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 the one that we can give the higher highest amount of uh, oxygen in the wards will not be effective in these patients where they would need some more oxygen. So high flow nasal oxygen is the best option at the moment. It will reduce the work of breathing, decrease the breathing rate, and better carbon. It will have a better carbon dioxide washout, and it will reduce the dead space as well. And ultimately, because we are using a cannula, it will be very comfortable for the patient. So we can give a high flow rates of uh, oxygen with a FiO2 ranging from 21 to 100% using high flow. So it's the best option at the moment in the severe observations. So in NIV, yes, there is a place. It will reduce the intubation and it will improve the in-hospital mortality. And the fact that it has this physiological benefit of keeping the uh, peep, peep, which can improve the alveolar ventilation recruitment and improve the hypoxia. But the problem is in practical point of view is that the failure rates are very, very high. Most of the time, the patients are opted for a uh, high flow oxygen. And is there a place for bilevel uh, or NIV or bilevel uh, uh, ventilation? Yes, but only in the advanced cases where you have respiratory muscle fatigue and all. Otherwise, it's usually the heat up that we are using. So, what is the place of invasive ventilation in a patient with acute exacerbations? So, IPF, what the guidelines suggest is against use, against the use of mechanical ventilation. Why? Because most of the studies have shown that acute exacerbation in IPF in ventilated patients, the mortality is around 90%. But, however, the perception of that all those ILDs are due to IPF and that their prognosis is bad, that is incorrect. So, uh, some of the uh, patients who have been having non-IPF ILD or some of, even the IPF ones, IPF, IPF ILDs, some may improve with the correct treatment, with the immunosuppression, and they will make a good recovery. So, that is, we, we, it is very important that we uh, decide them case-by-case case basis. And if we, we are to intubate, we have to use the lung protective ventilation so, as in ARDS, uh, with low tidal volumes and keeping the PEEP less than 10 because otherwise it will in, in, uh, cause more lung damage. So, extra, uh, is there a place for ECMO? Yes, only as a bridge for uh, transplant, not as a bridge for to recovery at the moment. And the lung transplantation, again, there is a place, but uh, not currently in, in our context. Uh, so, what I have to mention is that 
even though despite of having these all these evidence and all these uh, management and all these drugs and all that still the mortality is very very high in both uh, uh, ipf patients as well as in an non ipf patient so the prognosis following that is very very poor so that's why the palliative care and the symptomatic management come in hand there most of these patients we need early palliative team involvement even in their acute exacerbations however ideally the end of life decisions and the sealing of care should be taken before ideally before having the acute exacerbations in, in the stable period in your clinics basically so the symptomatic management is important with using oxygen at adequate flows and uh, giving op uh, uh, opioids and the benzodiazepine for more di severe dyspneas and that sometimes the high flow some, some may require high flow oxygen uh, for uh, is, the, is the preferred way of their oxygen support and how can we uh, can we prevent these acute exacerbations yes we can there are several ways but you know uh, not always realistic so hygienic measures are important including their oral hygiene and they can wear masks whenever they are out and the vaccination with annual influenza vaccination and the pneumococcal vaccination. If the patients are therapeutically immunosuppressed, male in the connective tissue disorder, ILDs, yes, we can uh, start them on prophylaxis for PCP and all that. And we, uh, the other things like stop, stop smoking and controlling IR pollution are also very important ones. Antifibrotics also has a place of preventing acute exacerbation, which has been shown in this trial, the combined, combined analysis of tomorrow and impulses trial that they have shown that in an internet will, uh, will, will demonstrate, has demonstrated that the time of first exacerbation has been prolonged with the use of internet. Perfidon also has shown to reduce the respiratory hospitalization. So that's it's important that the, our patients uh, even at the moment, we don't have in the government sector to be on antifibrity to uh, prevent exacerbations. So in conclusion, despite being the leading cause of mortality, uh, there are numerous unmet needs in managing an interstitial lung disease associated acute exacerbation. So uh, it is high time that we make a conscious call and adapt a very, you know, very uh, uh, methodical approach in managing these patients. To uh, in managing this patient to improve their quality of life as well as without you know without burdening the healthcare expenses in the country as well. So uh, that's uh, brings to me to brings me to the end of my talk. So I would like to thank Dr. Amit Fernando and Dr. Shanti Pereira, the certain respiratory physicians and my post MD trainers, trainers, and also Dr. Manohar Sanjana and Anmal Gurdisana and the audience today and uh, ultimately the patients that. Uh, Providing uh, me uh, as a valuable source of learning and not only about the diseases but also about the life as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Manisha. Okay, it's open for questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. it's a very good question. So basically, in the acute presentation, in the bedside, it's a very valuable like, uh, investigation that we can do. Uh, so one thing that we can exclude the uh, fluid over, features of fluid overload, and then we can look into features of uh, pleural effusions and pneumothorax and consolidations. But the problem is like some of these patients have several, a lot of these things together sometimes. So it might, you know, limit the use of ultrasound scan, but yes, it do help. And it's a very important thing that to mention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absent of any other question, thank you very much, Dr. Manisha, for the presentation here. And uh, as a token of uh, as a, uh, the certificate of appreciation to you, please accept.